On a Saturday afternoon two years ago, a red Vauxhall parked in the center of Omar. Inside were two men and up to 500 pounds of explosives. After arming the bomb, the two men walked away and melted into the crowd. Waiting nearby was a getaway car. These men, and the many more who helped them, were responsible for the single worst bombing atrocity of the Irish Troubles. Their legacy is carnage, carnage that was indiscriminate in every way. Twenty-nine men, women, children and babies were killed. The bombers were former members of the provisional IRA who opposed their ceasefire. They call themselves the real IRA. Two governments will do everything that is possible within their power to hunt down those responsible for this outrage. These people will never win. Democracy will triumph over evil. These evil people, these mindless people who do not care about the lives of this generation or future generations, but we will defeat them. The scale of the joint police investigation on both sides of the border is unprecedented. But two years on, none of the culprits is behind bars. Sadly, up to this point, we haven't been able to charge anyone uh, with this terrible atrocity, but we'll not rest until we do. We have built what we think is a very detailed intelligence picture. We think we know who carried out this atrocity. We think we know how they carried it out. But intelligence is one thing. Evidence that a court will accept is absolutely another thing. We need yet more public support. We get that public support, and we've had a lot of it, but we need the final pieces fitted into this jigsaw in terms of evidence rather than in terms of intelligence. But our intelligence is very precise. It's likely that only witnesses can provide the final pieces of this jigsaw. Several have already given vital evidence to the police, but they're too frightened to give evidence in court. The absence of prosecutions is an increasing burden for the families of the Omer bombing. As time has gone on, I am getting more, when I think about it more, I'm just so angry to think that, well, they murdered Oren and they murdered him and all those innocent people and to me I think why shouldn't they pay for what they done you know why should they get off with it despite the fact that the police on both sides of the Irish border know the identities of those they believe to have been the bombers there is no immediate prospect of charges so what is the evidence against them for the past few months Panorama has been investigating the Oma bombing as we shall show, there are a number of individuals who live along the border who have yet to provide explanations for their movements on the day of the bombing. Two days before the bombing, a red Vauxhall Cavalier left outside a block of flats in Carrick Macross, County Monaghan, was stolen. It was taken by an ordinary car thief, but this was no ordinary car theft. The car had been stolen to order by the real IRA. Somewhere in what's known as bandit country, the border area straddling South Armagh with the Irish Republic, the car was hidden for two days and loaded with a bomb. Supplying and assembling the bomb's components would have involved a chain of people. Someone made the false plates fitted to the bomb car. The power unit was housed in a lunchbox bought over the counter. Its construction was identical to 11 previous bombs. 500 pounds of farm fertilizer was used as explosive.
steel tubing had been machine tooled containing high explosive to boost the bomb to maximum effect. To trigger the bomb, a detonator was inserted. And this was connected to the power unit by wire running from the boot to the front passenger seat. According to the Irish police, the man who admitted stealing the bomb car said he'd been asked to by an intermediary. Telephone records show that in the early hours when the car was stolen, the thief contacted this intermediary. Immediately that conversation ended, the intermediary made three calls, traced to a builder who lives in this remote farmhouse in Cullerville, a Republican stronghold. The builder is this man, 30-year-old Seamus Daly, one of many Republican dissenters who live in this part of bandit country. Daly has already been arrested twice by the Irish police, but was released after he said nothing. On the morning of the Omer bombing, the bomb car was taken from its hideout and driven north. The police believe it travelled in convoy with a scout car ahead of it, leading it to its destination and checking the route was clear of police and soldiers. That Saturday in Buncrana, County Donegal, 50 miles north of Omer, a young boy was pleading with his mother to let him go on a trip to Omer with friends. His name was Oren Doherty. I was to wake him at nine and I wakened up at nine and I remember thinking oh, maybe I'll just let him lie, you know, I'll not bother waking him. And then I thought to myself, no, that wouldn't be fair on him, you know, because he was really looking forward to going and he hadn't got anywhere all summer. And they were just, you know, they were just so excited and you know, so carefree going away. And I always stood and watched the children till they went out of sight, you know, always just stood watching them and that's the last thing I remember about Oren is the four boys, there was four of them and the Spanish student as well just walking down the road talking away to each other and, you know I think I'm still waiting on Oren home to tell me you know about his trip that day just he still be waiting because he didn't come home you know As the bomb car and the scout car headed for the border, the police believe they communicated by mobile phone. This is based on an analysis of calls made in the hours before, during and after the bombing. This analysis may prove to be the key to the Omer bomb investigation. Mobile calls are relayed through a network of masts. The number of the phone making the call and the number of the phone receiving it are logged as is the time and duration of the call. The signal from a mobile telephone is usually routed through the mast nearest to it. Crucially, a record is kept of the location of the mast transmitting the call and the location of the mast receiving it. In this way, it is possible to keep track of the movements of a mobile telephone, sometimes down to two or three miles. There are two mobile phones whose records on the day of the bombing are of special interest. Their movements have been tracked north from the Irish Republic to Omer and back again. This was at a time consistent with the bombing and along a route consistent with the one the bomb car could have taken. One of these two phones belonged to this man, Colin Murphy, a wealthy builder. He's also a seasoned terrorist once he smuggled guns for the provisional IRA. Today he's opposed to their ceasefire. The other phone which travelled north was normally used by Murphy's foreman. Murphy was arrested by the Irish police and interviewed. Colin Murphy is said to have told them 
that on the eve of the Omer bombing, he had a rendezvous at this bar in the border town of Dundalk. The Emerald is owned by Murphy, and it's not a place for strangers. It's a haunt popular with Republican dissidents. According to the police, Murphy said he handed over both his mobile and his foreman's mobile to another builder. That builder was Seamus Daly, the man who records show had been contacted after the bomb car was stolen. When Murphy was first asked why he handed over the mobiles, he's alleged to have said, what can I say? I could finish out at the border with a hole in my head. Later, he said to have told the police he did know the mobiles were to be used to move bombs. We spotted Colin Murphy arriving at this building in Dundalk, which is where we caught up with him. Mr. Murphy, yes. my name is John Ware and I work for the BBC television program Panorama and I want to talk to you about the Omer bombing. Right. Okay. I wonder if you could explain to me why it is that you gave your mobile telephone and the mobile telephone of your foreman to Seamus Daly on the eve of the Omer bombing. I didn't give my phone to anybody. Well, the, uh, the police say that you well, admitted that. to them that well, you I did. Didn't, I didn't admit. You didn't. I didn't admit. You didn't. No. How is it that these phones? Can you explain how these I phones, how these phones became to be located in the Omer area? Um, at the time the bomb car was parked on the day of the Omer bombing. Can you explain that? No, I cannot. Do you think the Omer bombing was an atrocity or not? Terrible Charlie Lansborough on stage. A terrible happening was also what Murphy is said to have told the police. The loss of innocent lives, he said, was a disaster. On the day of the Omer bombing, the first communication from one of the mobiles allegedly handed over to Seamus Daly was picked up from this mast south of the border at Castle Blaney. The time was 12.41. There was a second call at 1.13. Both calls were from this first phone. There were no return calls. This would fit with a mobile and a scout car relaying short messages to a second mobile and a bomb car following behind. He never normally went into the town. He went down to um, buy a pair of jeans and a pair of boots. Um, and he, he had planned on only being in for a very short time. What sort of a son was Aidan? Uh, he, he was physically, he was six foot two. He was an extremely healthy young person. He, was, he had a lot of healthy interests that teenagers have. He enjoyed music. Um, his life was cars. Um, he enjoyed a home life. Um, he was somebody that was always willing to help. I don't know, he just felt that when we were, we were a complete family that we could have done anything. At 1.29 on the afternoon of the Omer bombing came another call from the first mobile. This was relayed through this mast at the border crossing at Ochnacloy. This call fits with a scout car giving instructions to a bomb car which of the several border roads was safe to cross. Meanwhile in Omer, the streets thronged with shoppers. There was real hope in the air. The Good Friday peace agreement had been signed. The IRA ceasefire was holding. By 2 p.m., the first mobile had moved yet further north and was in the Oma area. We know this because at three minutes to two, a fourth call from the first mobile to the second mobile was relayed through a mast in Oma. This would fit with the scout car, telling the bomb car it was safe to come on in. Me and Alan went to town every Saturday. 
But the night before, I went into his room and he said, Mum, I'm not going to town tomorrow. And he said it in a kind of a depressed tone of voice, which was unusual for Alan. And I thought, he's not well, he's not the same. So I walked out the room and I went back in and had a look at him, you know, and I thought, there's definitely something wrong with Alan. And I says, why do you not want to go to town? He says, I just don't want to go tomorrow. So the next day it was really me that asked him to go to the town, you know. At 2.18, a Vauxhall Cavalier, like the bomb car, was filmed by CCTV passing this petrol station in Oma. Its front suspension was raised, probably because of a heavy load in the boot. A minute later, the second mobile called the first mobile. Again, this would fit with the bomb car telling the scout car it was about to park. The time, 2.19, agrees precisely with when a witness claims to have seen a red Vauxhall Cavalier crossing a junction to where the bomb car was parked. It was at this point that its lethal cargo was armed. Another witness was struck by just how gingerly the passenger seemed to close the door. The bomb car's passenger and driver were last seen heading down this path to the car park of a local store. Almost certainly, they made their getaway with their friends in the scout car. There were no further calls between the two mobiles, which would fit with them now being in the same car. Just beautiful girl, just a girl that I'll never be or I five. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't be as nice a girl as Esther. She was um, so religious. She just was the odd one out in our family, but in a good way. That morning, me and Esther fell out. And it's the kind of thing that I've learned to live with it now. She took too long in the shower for my liking. And um, it was a bit of a ruckus. But sisters, just put it down to sisters arguing and fighting. And that was the, that was the last I seen Esther. She went out to go down to home to buy flowers for the church. As the bombers headed back towards the border, the first of three warning calls was made from a phone box in South Armagh to the newsroom of Ulster Television in Belfast. Newsroom? There's a bomb in Oma. It's on Main Street. It's 500 pounds. What was that? The code word is Marta Pope. Say again. Marta Pope. This is Oakley the Herd. Two other warnings came in quick succession. In all three, the caller signed off with the words Martha Pope, which was then the authentic code word for the real IRA. So, who made these calls? The final warning was made from this phone box, also in the Newry area, at 2.31. 30 seconds earlier, someone holding a mobile picked up a text message. This mobile has also been located in the same area as the phone box. Could whoever received that text message also have then made the final warning call? Both call boxes involved in the warnings were removed for examination by forensic scientists. Every inch of them and every single coin in them was fingerprinted in an attempt to discover who made the warning calls. The RUC drew a blank. There are, however, other clues as to the identity of someone involved in relaying the calls. The mobile that received the text message just before the bomb warning call was registered to the man who runs this company. Oliver Trainer has a flourishing business selling plastic window frames, the virtues of which he tried to sell us when we filmed him covertly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Say it and drop back into me. And then the two of us are going to have a look at it and give you a rough phrase and see what happens. When Mr. Trainer was questioned by the Irish police, he said the mobile in question had gone missing and he didn't know who'd had it on the day of the bombing. So he was released. There's only 40 pound of window. But if it's only if it's new work, it's not going to be 40 pound of window. It'll, it'll be nothing. However, Oliver Trainer's denial that he knew where his missing mobile went is odd, to say the least. Odd because cell phone records show that another mobile belonging to Mr. Trainer made two calls to his missing mobile shortly before the bomb exploded. So if it was Mr. Trainer who made these calls, he'd surely have known to whom he was speaking. What's more, this was not the first real IRA bombing where Mr. Trainer's mobiles had been active. Records show no fewer than 50 calls were made from them around the time of bomb attacks on Lisbon and Newry. But the authorities believe that on its own, this pattern of calls is insufficient to bring charges. We as Irish Republicans have challenged the legitimacy of continued British interference in Irish affairs. Mr. Trainer is reputedly linked to the 32 County Sovereignty Committee, the political wing of the Real IRA. We secretly film the participants of their first meeting after Omer. One is said to have had Oliver Trainer's mobile on the evening of the bombing. The witness has told the police he always rang the mobile to contact this man. The man's name is Liam Campbell. He's a neighbour of Oliver Trainer, and according to intelligence sources, he's the so-called officer commanding the real IRA. Not surprisingly, the authorities fear the witness wouldn't give evidence in court. So we wanted to ask Mr. Campbell if he did have Mr. Trainer's mobile on the day of the OMA bombing. Liam Campbell lives in a comfortable house just a few yards inside the Irish Republic. When we arrived, there were signs of family life everywhere. But of Mr. Campbell, there was no sign. So we went to the workshop of his friend, Oliver Trainer, but he saw us coming and moved quickly to pull down the shutters. Trainer, I'd like to speak to you. I'm from the BBC, from Panorama, and I want to ask you some questions about the owner bomb. One of the questions I want to ask you, Mr. Trainer, is did you lend your mobile phone to anyone on August the 15th, 1998. The families of the OMA bombing would like answers to these questions, Mr. Trainer. Are you going to come out and answer them, or are you going to stay inside? We soon found an explanation for the locked doors at Mr. Campbell's house. Mr. Trainer! Next to his van was Mr. Campbell's Audi. It appears he'd locked himself in with his neighbour. To whom did you lend your mobile phone on August the 15th, 1998? Was it Mr. Liam Campbell? Can you tell me why your telephone appears to have been used in several other bombings? We followed up our visit with letters to Mr. Campbell and Mr. Trainer asking detailed questions, but they didn't answer them, except to deny any involvement in the OMA bombing. The wife was um, a very quiet home person. Um, she used to go shopping on a once a week in OMA, and it was get in and get the shopping done and get home as quickly as you can. And like that particular day, I tortured myself about it for a month after it. You know, if I hadn't come home early, she wouldn't have been in home that day. If I got up and went to my work at the time I should have went, we wouldn't have been in home that day.
On the day of the bombing, the last call from one of the mobiles that had been in Oma was at 2.38 p.m. The signal was routed through a mast south of Oma in Ballygawley. So the mobile phone was moving south towards the border. That fits with the call coming from the getaway car. Once again, the call was to the mobile said to have been held by Liam Campbell, the alleged OC of the real IRA. Perhaps the getaway car was checking that the warning calls had been made. Smyrna Oscar 7 0 from Oscar. Send over. Roger, will you get 7 1 and go short of the courthouse? I would say, I would suggest, well, short of the courthouse, there's a bomb warning in from about three different locations. And take a wander up, checking for cars that seem to be heavily laden down. It's supposed to be 500 pounds. The bomb warnings were unclear. This was probably deliberate to stop the bomb being diffused. The warnings mentioned the courthouse and Main Street. There is no Main Street in Oma. The police began moving people as far away from the courthouse as they could. Unwittingly, they were moving people ever closer to the bomb. I think Tracy said to her, Mommy, come on, we'll go home. And you're, uh, we laughed at them. You know, uh, it's only a, it's a bomb scare, it'll be over in a few minutes. Nobody thought there was one and I parked my car around Johnson Car Park and then when we were in Kelly's a policeman come in and he asked us to move on ahead farther down Marcus Day. instead of that we were being moved right in on top of it top of the bomb top of the bomb the bomb car's southern Irish plates had been replaced with northern ones so police checks wouldn't have shown it was stolen this picture graphically illustrates how little suspicion the car attracted it was taken by a Spanish tourist five minutes before the bomb exploded she died, as did several others in the picture. At 3 p.m., the bus carrying eight-year-old Oren Doherty and his friends arrived in Oma. The boys had been having their lunch. Oren decided they would buy one chicken and share it between them. And they had ice cream and all that. And so it seems they were enjoying themselves anyway. And I remember Emmett now saying to, told one of my sisters that he remembers the last words he remembers Orm saying was this chicken's lovely to think that he was so you know he was so full of life and all just you know minutes before he died like even you know to think it, it breaks my heart thinking about them getting out of that bus in Oma down at the depot in Oma not knowing, you know, what they were going up walking into their deaths, you know. Like people say to me, sure isn't it all the better he didn't, he didn't know, and so it was, but at the same time, it's so hard. They were so innocent, you know, and not realising the danger they were in. I remember the the eeriness, this darkness just came over the place and everything was hazy and then I remember hearing screams and I had a bit of glass, it was a big big bit in the back of my head and I pulled it out. I thought I'm dying. I went into the window at what was left of the window he had shop and I found the wife lying face down in the rubble. Um, I checked for pulse. I panicked, I done everything, headed out the door and I don't know who the gentleman was, but he was walking down the far side of the street and he shouts over and he says, you have a wee ginger haired girl. And the words I said to him was I had, for I was convinced she was dead. He says, no, she's in the hospital. There were bodies scattered all over the street, many had been covered. There were body parts, pieces of, piece of brain, pieces of arms, pieces of legs. Um, there was a torrent of water uh, flowing down uh, the street. There were electrical cables sparking. There were roof slates falling onto the road nearby. Uh, it was a, a scene from hell. We 
pulled over uh, a lady who looked as though she was in her 20s or 30s, turned her over and there was a naked child lying underneath her. Uh, the, the child was had its arms crossed and um, uh, I made an assessment hoping that I'd find some sort of life there um, and pronounce life extinction on her and as it turned out her mother. I see their faces, I see their faces daily. Um, I look into my daughter's face and I see the face of the children I saw that day. 29 people of all faiths and political persuasions were killed by the bomb in Omar. Most were women. One family lost three generations. A grandmother, her daughter, her baby and her unborn twins. The dead also included five other children and five teenagers. 232 people were treated in hospital, some blinded, many disfigured for life. And then I thought, I need to, I need to find Alan. You know, I need to find Alan. That's, that's always in my mind, finding Alan. And then this girl came, and I was bleeding, you know, I was bleeding a lot because I'd on a white T-shirt and the blood, I was just all red by this time, all around my front. And this girl, she, she pulled me back and she says, you need to go to the hospital. They said that the bomb had exploded in the town centre. We knew Aidan was down in the town. So um, at that stage I went to the Trunk County Hospital. When I got up into the casualty department, um, there seemed to be hundreds of people out on the actual back entrance to the hospital because there was no room inside it. Um, some people seemed to have very horrific injuries and in the background I could see the army helicopters taken off from the helipad. Um, and there was another helicopter waiting to land. It was a scene just reminded me of what we seen in the 70s in Vietnam, except that it wasn't soldiers, it was women and children. I don't recall how I got to Oma. That was the Trone County in Oma. But I remember running, running round the hospital to see if we could find her. And all I remember that night is just, I'm like, blood-stained footprints on the corridors, you know, the long corridors of a hospital, and, like, paper forms of some type, you know, just saturated in blood. By the time the bomb exploded, at four minutes past three, we can assume the bombers were safely back in the Irish Republic. Further evidence that Seamus Daly was using one of the mobiles that had travelled to and from Omer that day came at 3.30 p.m. The records show that the phone linked to Daly called a businessman. In a signed statement, the man has told the Irish police that the caller was Seamus Daly. They were talking about how to make money together from a tax scam. But as with other witnesses in this case, this witness has also told the police he doesn't want to give evidence against Daly in court. I kept just watching all the ambulances and we sat there for, must have been hours, and you were asking all the lists, have you seen Alan, you know, is Alan Radford's name on the list? And there, there was no name of Alan on the list. Everybody was asking, you know, everybody was so concerned. So then they sent us home, us that were able to go home. And I went home and um, to find out if he had arrived home and he hadn't. And um, I went back. I went back then to the hospital, and I couldn't find him again. Um, and I went back home again. And at that stage, uh, I remember lighting a candle on the front window. As the night wore on, you just knew that um, it wasn't going to end up the way you wanted it. That same Saturday night in Dundalk, the Emerald Bar, now called McDonald's, was host to some of those linked by the mobile phones to Omar. What's alleged to have been said here would amount to an admission from Daly that he knew all about the bomb car. 
One of the mobiles handed over to Daly in this bar the previous evening belonged to a building foreman. That Saturday, the foreman's phone had been to Omer and back, as the phone records show. That night, the foreman happened to be here in the Emerald Bar when Seamus Daly approached him. Perhaps it was the drink in Daly. But according to the foreman, Daly seemed to make light of the carnage unfolding in Omer. In a bantering way, Daly is said to have remarked to the foreman, you drove the yoke to Omer. By yoke, the foreman says he took Daly to mean the bomb car. The foreman is unlikely to give evidence against Daly through fear, so we try to put several questions to Mr. Daly ourselves. Eventually we identified a white van he was driving. But Daly was a difficult man to follow, and we lost him down a maze of country roads around the border. Then we spotted his van at his farmhouse off the beaten track. It seemed to have been parked to block our entry. Daly was obviously expecting cameras. We knew Seamus Daly was in the house. His mobile was lying on the table, but he was lying low. Mr. Daly? My name is John Ware and I work for the BBC Panorama program. And I'd like to ask you some questions, please, about the Omer bombing. I know that you're in the house because your van is here. One thing I'd like you to explain, Mr. Daly, please, is how you came to be in possession of a mobile telephone which was located in the Omer area at about the time that the bomb car was parked. I'd also like you to explain, please, how your own personal mobile telephone came to be linked to another bombing, Lisbon, which led up to the Omer bombing. Mr. Daly, I know that you're in the house, and I do think you owe the families of Omer an explanation for the questions I have asked you. But Seamus Daly stayed behind his front door, so I decided to try to talk to him on the telephone. I just dialed the Daly home number. Number busy. It seems that Daly was summoning reinforcements. The local police informed us that minutes after we left, a posse of his brothers and friends arrived. Through his lawyer, Mr. Daly has since denied any part in the Omer bombing. Despite the scale of the police investigation, even reconstructing bomb parts from tiny fragments, the authorities need more evidence for a prosecution. There are 15 men suspected of involvement in the bombing. Without knowledge of their names, potential witnesses may be unaware of vital evidence they might possess. But there must be a whole range of people, associates, uh, even friends, people shocked to the core by this atrocity who have vital pieces of information as to the activity of those who were actually involved in this atrocity. And those people, if given encouragement, uh, might just exercise their judgment properly and come forward to us or to the Garda Síochána. The Commissioner of the Garda Síochána is on record as saying he's not sure the culprits will ever be caught. Do you share that view? We will never give up the quest for these people. And I am yet optimistic that given yet further public cooperation, we will bring these people to justice. Well, I didn't see my son then until they brought him home in a coffin. And I thought, this can't be my son coming through this door. But um, I remember the shrapnel wounds over the face. I didn't see his body. I think Alan was all in one piece, as far as I know, which is something that maybe other families didn't even get to see their loved ones, you know. And uh, I just, I can't remember the, the shrapnel wounds and that in his face. I know he had, you know, quite a bit. But all I saw was a beautiful piece on his face. Look, he was at peace and he was, he was happy. 
and I, I miss him, miss him so much. Well, when I when I came in through the door, um, they just came out into the hall, and we just all um, burst into tears, and we. I don't think there was. I, I just said to Aidan, "I'm not be coming home," and uh, you know that was that was a difficult, a very very difficult day. So my brother and I took me down Sunday night to the makeshift morgue outside on that. And I remember going in there and it was just so cold. And I just remember his eyes wide open as if he was looking up. And whatever way his lip was, I just, to me, he was crying when he died. You know, whatever way his wee lip was, his bottom lip, to me it looked as if he was crying. It wouldn't matter what time I came into the house. The wife might have been in bed, but there was always a noise. It's an awful thing to walk into your home for the first time and hear the clocks ticking. I have lost the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, she never can be replaced. And... Um, that's something I'm going to just have to live with. Whoever bombed Omar, and those who know they did it, also have a terrible burden to live with. Their consciences 